Multiple myeloma, a rare disease of blood and bones, and despite all of the medical advances and all the famous faces behind it, it still remains one of the deadliest cancers with one of the lowest survival rates on record. I'm here in Cambridge, Massachusetts to meet the experts, the survivors, the warriors determined to defeat this double-edged cancer. Hi, I'm Erica Vitrini and welcome to Access Health, a special edition where we go behind the mystery. The phone rang and it was the doctor and I could tell that he was upset uh, from his voice. I sank to the depths of the earth and called my husband and told him it just, it felt like an out of body experience. I was not just stunned, but I was kind of at sea. My first reaction was, how long do I have? Most people with a cancer diagnosis think that you're talking to somebody else that couldn't possibly be happening to me. The oncologist reviewed the numbers on the screen, turned to me at the end and said, you have a malignancy. It's called multiple myeloma. And I wanted to live, and I wanted to see our daughter grow up, and I wanted to grow old with my husband. And then I began immediately to think about my family. Uh, I didn't think about dying, because I guess I knew in the back of my mind that was a real possibility. But I was mostly concerned about my family uh, being able to get along with their lives if I were not around. I had run out of medication for my allergies and decided to call the doctor. But at the same time, I was starting to be extremely tired. Um, and it was a deep, dark tiger that did not respond to sleep or rest. Um, and I mentioned it to the doctor and thought that he would do his usual, just give me a prescription so I could get my medication and go off to the Sea Islands. In the summer of 2013, I developed a very pesky backache. It just wouldn't go away. The orthopedist with whom I've been dealing for a long time all said, oh, come on, Tom, it's your lifestyle. You're out there banging around. You know, I've been riding bikes across South America. I was bird hunting in Africa. I was on a lot of airplanes, but it didn't disappear. So finally, at the Mayo Clinic, my internist became very suspicious and said backache shouldn't last that long. I was a health professional. I traveled a lot, and I just thought that being tired was a result of that. And so he did what I thought was just routine blood work. I went back to the office. In a couple of days, the phone rang, and it was the doctor. And he shared that they thought it was multiple myeloma. And the oncologist reviewed the numbers on the screen, turned to me at the end, and said, you have a malignancy. It's called multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is the uh, second most common of the hematologic malignancies. So it's a blood-borne cancer, if you like. It's systemic, meaning it touches all parts of the body, develops in the bone marrow. That malignant cell has the capacity to go to different parts of the body and proliferate and destroy where it ends up. I knew what myeloma was, and I knew I didn't want to have it. Um, and found myself thinking that if this disease was supposedly so rare, why couldn't I have won the lotto instead? <laughs> but you deal with the hand that's dealt you. Um, but because I had worked in healthcare and because my particular interest was disparities, um, I was aware of multiple myeloma and knew that it disproportionately affected African Americans. But I also knew that the literature suggested that it was an older person's disease. I was 49 years old. The median age is about 70 years old at, at diagnosis. But there are patients who, who are younger who have this disease. And patients will present with back pain, fatigue. They'll be found to be anemic. And it's in the workup of why they are anemic that the multiple myeloma can be discovered. Sometimes x-raying the skeleton where the pain is will show some of the lytic or holes in the bone from myeloma. So there's a, a variation in the way patients may present with the disease and it can be a it can be a challenge in the diagnosis but we have to be aware of it and um, um, and that will help. I had a hole in my pelvis, I had two compression fractures in my lower spine, and then later, four compression fractures that were very ugly up and down my spine, which required a process called kypoplasty, which they had to go in and repair them. 
And during that, I lost two inches of height, which was pretty hard to handle. When I found out that my bones weren't compromised, I thought, oh, we got here in a good time. And the doctor basically gave us no hope. He said uh, that my husband should take me home. And when the discomfort reached a significant enough level that, that he would provide some treatment for me. The literature then wasn't very good either, wasn't very optimistic and certainly didn't offer any promise of hope. Depending on age, um, the patient who's newly diagnosed and not previously been treated um, would be considered for a stem cell transplant. Um, maybe one, maybe two, depending on the, uh, the circumstances. Um, patients who aren't eligible or un are unsuitable for a transplant, maybe because of age or underlying other illness besides the multiple myeloma, would be considered for um, drug therapy. So I went to the office, got online, looked up everything I could find on multiple myeloma, and then I referred myself to another doctor for a second opinion. Going through a transplant is different for each person, so I've never tried to share with anybody. It's an experience that if, if you're called on to go through, you go through it because you want to come out the other side, and it was the best chance of survivorship that I had at that point. When you go to see a physician for whatever ails you, do not treat him as the emperor of a Mayan temple. They don't speak a different language. You must say to them, Doc, I just don't get what you're talking about. Talk to me in plain language here. What else should I be reading? And I know you won't mind, but and I do trust you, but I think I'm gonna call a couple of other physicians and just see what they have to say. Medicine is not math. It's not two plus two equal four. It's very subjective. Each doctor or physician will look at a particular case and generally have a slight variation on what's the best treatment. That was my first exposure to a successful therapy. While Dr. Dixie Esseltine was observing landmark positive results from one patient in a clinical trial, another patient was also embarking on his own landmark cancer journey. The name's Bond, James Bond. I was diagnosed with an incurable blood cancer, multiple myeloma, and I was told I would live at most three years. That was 23 years ago. I've had four stem cell transplants in 23 years, and I think they're a valuable tool in the toolbox of dealing with multiple myeloma. I had the pleasure of meeting Jim and his wife, Kathleen, while they were visiting Cambridge for a wellness checkup. Kathleen and Jim, we have to talk about something first. 45 years of marriage. There's a love story there. There is, and I want to start by saying I am the real James Bond. You are. And I can prove that because this is the beautiful Bond girl of 45 years, <laughs> Kathleen. He Love says it. that every time and it works. It works. <laughs> for 45 years it's worked for you. It has. <laughs> so tell me, when did you start to notice changes? Well, I noticed just before our youngest son went off to college that Jim looked like he was beaten down and had kind of the weight of the world on his shoulders. He just seemed like he was shrinking a little. It was a good thing he had a physical coming up. I was required by my company to have a physical examination. And during that examination, they found I had too much, too much protein in my urine. So that's red flags. Yeah, and one thing led to another, and they finally diagnosed this oddball cancer that we had never heard of called multiple myeloma. And the x-rays showed I had a lot of bone damage, and the sore ribs I thought I had were actually broken ribs. And I actually asked the diagnosing doctor, I said, how long do you think I'll live with this incurable blood cancer? Mm -hmm. And he said, at most, Jim, if everything goes well, you'll live at most three years. So where do you go now? What sort of treatment do you take on? Well, it involved my first stem cell bone marrow transplant, which was shortly after diagnosis, and it worked fine, and I got a nice long five-plus year remission. So we knew it would come back, and, and so our agenda during that time was to try to plan what to do when it would come back. We really lobbied the doctor to do another transplant. And after clearing some hurdles, we did. Got me another three years. And then we did some other things that were possible under the traditional drugs. And finally, at the end of 10 years, we were done with things that would work and my cancer was out of control. You're at a point where you have to do something drastically different. Yes, that last step 
was something that was rarely done, and that was to get another stem cell transplant, which is number three, from my matching sister, Becky. My cancer, when I received them, was too high. They could not get the cancer level down. There were no drugs available to get the cancer down. So I was getting ready to die. My memory is our doctor said, Jim, you need to go to a hospice. You're done. There's nothing left for you. And we were stubborn and insistent that we were going to try and we were going to try to find an opening in a clinical trial that we had heard about. We were lucky enough to get an out-of-town doctor to, to admit us into his clinical trial, providing we would come to his city, live there for nine months. The doctor had said, are you willing to relocate for nine months? Jim said yes. He packed everything he owned. I packed for a long weekend because I didn't think he was going to make it. I thought I'd be coming back with a body. So after you entered the clinical trials, how quickly did you start to see results? Jim was laying there, barely able to sit up and was barely able to eat. And I noticed after a couple of treatments, all of a sudden he's up, anxious to go out and walk. He wants to go out to a restaurant. I mean, suddenly he's vibrant. And you know, my husband was back. And within two weeks, we've, I saw that evidence. So when we came to the hospital and the study nurse came out to tell Jim his results, I could have told her without knowing those results, his cancer level had dropped 99%. Oh my goodness, 99%. Yeah, it was, it was quite remarkable and they wanted to do another test to be sure it was true and it was true and within, within a matter of months I achieved complete remission. Again, with the understanding that this disease still has no cure yet, it's going to come back, but really for the last 13 years this disease has largely been under control. And so I continue to, to look for a clinical trial when it's time for me to do something to manage my disease. Now that's not to say any of this has been easy because right. it's been very, very hard. Talk to us about what it's been like as a caregiver by his side the whole time. Well, initially it was terrifying, absolutely terrifying, but I threw myself into controlling all the pieces and parts that I could. And if that meant I made sure that he ate well and I could do what I could do to help him be the best possible patient, that's what I did. But also I think it really helped me and empowered me to find out everything I could about the disease so that I could ask good questions and I took copious notes, but I would try to find out what's out on the horizon because we know, even today, when this disease rears its ugly head, we know there are things out on the horizon and we know who we can talk to and where we can go, what there is to find out because, as I said, we like to think we're managing this and we're not letting it manage us. What are some of the things you sort of deal with? Yeah. Uh, well, mental stress is clearly there, it is hard. Uh, there have been some physical side effects that are real, and I don't want to minimize them. I, I am a couple inches shorter than I was when I started. My, my spine has collapsed from when the myeloma was active. My spine is curved. I'm twisted around. I've had a hip replaced. I'm wearing contacts because of graft versus host disease in my eyes, that without these I cannot see well enough to drive a car. There's a lot of day-to-day -day chronic things to manage this disease that, that are part of my life right now. It's not easy. It is, I'm, I'm not trying to give the impression that this is an easy ride. It's a hard ride. It's really, what are you willing to do? And I've got an awful lot to live for. I've got Kathleen, I've got our sons, I've got the grandchildren, great family supporting us. And so we're in it for whatever, whatever I can do to, to keep going, I will do. I just want to thank you so much for your time. It's really, not only is it a story of hope, uh, determination, stubbornness, but it's also a love story. So thank you so much for sharing oh, with thank us. You. Oh, I thank have to you. Go get a tissue down. No, no, thank you. Dry the eyes thank a bit. Well, I can, I can tell you that sharing our story is it helps, us. It helps us. It helps us a lot. My right. disease is coming back. I know that, but we'll be ready for it when it does. The road to successful treatments has been a long one, and multiple myeloma has been a worthy opponent. Well, I became involved um, more formally with uh, multiple myeloma trials in the year 2000, and the first multiple myeloma patient in that trial actually had a complete response, so she became uh, disease-free under the influence of this new drug that was being developed at the time. That was my first exposure to a successful therapy. Now subsequently we did 
a larger trial in phase two, and that was where we got more definitive proof of it, the safety and the effectiveness in relapsed multiple myeloma patients. We need more patients to participate in the clinical trials. We have just a small percentage who do, and there are a number of advantages to doing so. Multiple myeloma survivors are now able to live their lives better than ever before with advances in treatments. I'm really pleased that we're at the point that multiple myeloma has become treatable. I still want to work toward the day that it becomes curable and preventable. So there's a lot of information and knowledge that we still need. Um, and I think that if we all contribute whatever time and talents and resources we have toward that, they will get to that goal. I realize if I was starting out now, knowing what I know now, I would start out <clears throat> looking at multiple myeloma as a marathon. And I would think, what I do in my treatment today, how is that gonna impact me two decades from now? Caregivers are so important, and it's a drain on them as well. So I had the core of my medical team, and then my family, and we've always been supportive of each other. They really became the support structure. They became the prop that kept me up. Meredith especially uh, monitored uh, all of my meds that I had to take every day, gave me tough love when I thought I was going to go out of the house and get on an airplane and said, no, 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 you're not going to do that. I always tell people who are being diagnosed with cancer, look to your family, get an ombudsman. If you don't have a doctor in the family, find a friend who can do the interpretation for you. Yeah, the lessons learned, are, they're, they're really four of them, and it's, it's uh, daily exercise, no matter what stage you're at. It's getting second opinions when they make sense. It's entering a clinical trial when it makes sense to you. It's having the world's greatest caregiver and medical team that you can possibly get around you. I think that once we get through the initial shock, I would hope that each person who has myeloma commits themselves to doing something in terms of the resolution of this disease for future generations. Um, it's a formidable opponent, but I also feel that there's a formidable group of people out here now, whether they're advocates or physicians or researchers or pharmaceutical companies or whatever they are, focused on this disease and making a difference in the lives of people. Now the gains sometimes are small though, and as a researcher you see the small gains as being large compared to what we could have done. But again, I don't think we can forget that when it's a patient, family member, um, those incremental benefits have to be a lot larger. You know, that's, that's what people um, deserve and that's where I think, um, I think we are trying to, uh, uh, trying to strive for those bigger gains for patients. Some people ask me if it was worth it. I've been through a lot. It hasn't been, it hasn't been easy. It's been at times very difficult. And my answer is, heck yes, it's been worth it because having time with my wife, the rest of the family, all the memories we have, all the more memories we're going to be creating, it's very, very worthwhile. And it's just, it's just been an amazing journey and I thank everybody that's been involved. At the end of the day, my cancer's in remission. I'm feeling better. I'm now almost three years older than I was when I was diagnosed. So there, there are the aches and pains that come with that but it has given me a better focus on life about the things that I really care about, beginning with my family and sorting out those priorities that I get the greatest reward from. So it was a hell of an ordeal. It's not entirely over, but it's been very instructive and I'm glad that I learned as much as I did and I'm gonna spend a lot of my life sharing that. Now we just have to increase awareness and keep supporting cancer research no matter for what um, disease and uh, I think we're making advances slower than we'd like in some areas but there's been some dramatic progress in this particular disease and I just hope for more and I'll work for more. And there you have it. What began as one of the most deadly and untreatable cancers garnered the attention of some of the most passionate cancer specialists in the world. Those same experts now have a greater hope for multiple myeloma patients and even dare to say they're closing in on a cure. For more information, go to the MMRF.org or visit us at accesshealth.tv. Who are you writing for?